What's up guys, welcome to Bardent, my name is Heinrich, and today we're finally going to start taking a look at combat for our 2D platformer. We're going to do this in two parts. The first part will be about setting up the player's combat controller, and the second part will be about setting up the super basic enemy controller to take the damage our character is ready to deal. This should cover most of what we need to know to make the player and enemy interact. We'll start off by heading into our sprites folder and importing the sprites we're going to need. We can then select all of them and just change the settings in the inspector like we usually do. We'll start off by setting our pixels per unit to 16, changing the sprite mode to multiple, setting the filter mode to point no filter, and then finally changing the compression to none. After hitting apply, we can go through and slice our sprites. So select the first one and click on sprite editor, then hit slice and make sure that you are on grid by cell size and that the pixel size is 64 on the X and 64 on the Y. Finally, we can hit slice and then hit apply. Repeat this for the other two sprite sheets as well. We can now pull up our animation window and begin creating the two attack animations for our character. So click on the player and then in the animation window, create a new clip. Navigate to the animations folder and name it attack1 underscore 1. We're then going to change the sample rate to 15 and drag in the sprites for our first attack. Now we can just repeat this one more time for the second attack animation. I decided that the other animations were too slow, so we're going to go through and change the sample rate to 15 in all the other animations. We are done with the animation window for now, so we can just dock it down below again. Now let's click on our player and head into the animator window. I'm just going to take a second to rearrange everything and make it look a little nicer. We can now create all the new parameters we're going to use. The first one will be of type boolean and we will call it is attacking. This parameter will be used to stop other animations from overriding our attack animation. The next parameter is also boolean and will be called first attack. This parameter will be used so that we can alternate between the two attack animations. Next, we'll have another boolean called attack1. This parameter will be set to true when we wish to play the attack animation. And then we have one last boolean called can attack, which is just to allow us to turn off combat later if we want to. Now for the transitions. We'll make our first transition from any state to our first attack animation state. In the inspector, make sure that has exit time is not ticked and then change the transition duration to zero. Now under conditions, we will do the following. The first condition will be attack one must be true. The next is first attack must also be true then can attack must be true, and then finally can climb ledge must be false. We have this condition because we don't want to interrupt our ledge climb. From our attack state, we can then make a transition to our idle state. This time, we want to make sure has exit time is ticked and that the transition duration is set to zero and exit time is set to one. This means that the transition will take place at the end of the animation and that it will happen instantly. Next, we can make a transition from our any state to our second attack animation state. Again, make sure that has exit time is not ticked and that our transition time is zero. The conditions will be exactly the same as last time, except for first attack, which in this case should be false. I also forgot to make the transition back to idle here, but go ahead and do exactly like we did for the first attack state. Now we can head to the transition from our any state to our rise slash fall blend tree and add the condition is attacking is false. We can also add this condition to the transition to our wall slide state. And that's it for the animator. Let's start working on our script. Head into the scripts folder and create a new script. We'll call it player combat controller. Go ahead and add the script onto the player game object and open it up in Visual Studio. We'll start off by deleting all the pre-generated code. We want to be able to control if the player can currently hit stuff or not. So we're going to make a boolean to control that. So we'll say square bracket, serialize field, square bracket. And then right under that, we'll say private bool combat enabled. We can now set this value in the inspector. Our first function will be private void check combat input. This function will be responsible for detecting any combat related input from the player. Inside, we will say if input dot get mouse button down zero. This will return true when the left mouse button is pushed. If this is true, we will then say if combat enabled, then attempt combat. What we're going to do here is hold the input from the player so that if we click a little bit before we are actually able to hit, 
the character will still hit once he is able, just like we did for the jump input. So we'll declare another private boolean called GodInput and set it to true in the if statement. Next, we're going to declare a private float and call it LastInputTime. This will be responsible for storing the last time we attempted to attack. So inside the if statement, we can say LastInputTime equals time.time. .time. Now we can just create our update function and call checkCombatInput from the update function. Our next function will be private void check attacks and will be responsible for making the attack happen when we get an input. Go ahead and call this function from update as well. In the function we will say if got input then perform attack 1 and then right underneath that we'll say if time.time .time is greater than or equal to last input time plus input timer then wait for a new input. Input timer will be how long to hold the input for. So let's go up to the top and declare our variables. We'll create another serialize field for our private float input timer. We can also declare a private animator anim to hold the reference to our animator component. We can then create our start function and in that we'll say anim equals get component of type animator. We can then also say anim.setBool can attack to combat enabled so that our animator will know if combat is allowed from the get go. Now we can declare two more booleans and call them is attacking and is first attack. We can then scroll back to our check attacks function and we'll start off by saying if not is attacking, meaning we are not currently in an attack animation, then got input equals false, is attacking equals true, and is first attack equals not is first attack. This line is used to alternate between the two animations. We can then set our animation parameters with anim.setBool, attack1 is true, and anim.setBool, first attack, is is first attack, and finally anim.setBool, is attacking, is is attacking. In our other if statement, we just need to say got input equals false. Those are our two main functions for this script so far. Next we're going to write a few smaller functions that will get called from our animations. The first one is private void check attack hitbox. This function will get called when we get to the impact part of the animation and will detect all damageable objects in a range and damage them. So we can create an array of type collider2d called detected objects and we'll set it equal to physics2d.overlap circle all which will return all the objects detected in a circle, hence the need for an array. Now let's go back up to the variables and declare everything we need for this part. We'll make another serialize field for a private transform called attack1 hitbox position. This will store a reference to a game object we will create as a child to our player and will allow us to position the hitbox where we want. Next we're going to have another serialize field and this one will have a private layer mask called what is damageable. This will be used to make it so we know what objects actually need to be detected and which don't. Next we can also create another private float called attack1 radius. This will be the radius of the physics 2D circle we use as our hitbox. And lastly we need one more float called attack1 damage. This will be used to store the damage the attack does. Before we go back to our function let's set last input time equal to mathf.negativeinfinity so that we will always be ready to attack from the start of the game. Now let's head back down to our function. Inside our overlap circle all, we will use attack1 hitbox pos dot position as our point and attack1 radius as our radius and finally what is damageable as our layer mask. After this we're going to generate a for each loop by typing for each and hitting tab twice. We will use this to loop through all the objects in our detected objects array. Inside the loop we're going to say collider which refers to the specific object in our array dot transform dot parent dot send message. Send message is used to call a specific function on a script on an object without knowing which script it is. So we can have different scripts for different enemy types and other things we want to be able to damage and all we need to do is make sure that they all have a function called the same thing. In our case we're going to call this function damage and the damage function is going to have an input parameter of type float that is the amount of damage to be done so we will pass it attack1 damage. In the next part you will see why we call the parent of the collider we are detecting. After this we can instantiate our hit particle. 
but I actually decided to do this in the damage function of our enemy script so that we can have different hit particles for different enemies. And that's that for this function. Our next function will be private void finish attack one. This function will get called at the end of the attack animation and will let our script know that it is done. So inside the function, all we need to do is set is attacking equal to false and then pass that to our animator with anim.setbool is attacking and is attacking. And then we also need to set the attack one parameter to false with anim.setbool attack one false. Now the last function we're going to create is the private void on draw gizmos function. And we'll use this to draw our hitbox. So we'll say gizmos.drawWireSphere using attack one hitbox position dot position as our position and attack one radius as our radius. We're almost done. All we need to do now is head into our player controller script and write two functions that'll be used to enable flip and disable flip from our animations. I see now that I made these functions public, but I'm pretty sure they can be private as well, just like in the other script. So we'll just create a function called disable flip in which we'll say can flip equals false and then create a function called enable flip in which we say can flip equals true. If you're having trouble with your character not transitioning to the idle animation as soon as you stop, come up to the check movement direction function and change this part to mathf.absrb.velocity.x is greater than or equal to 0.01f. That fixed it for me. We can now head back into Unity and click on our player and go to the animation window. To call the functions we created, we will use an animation event. So on the first frame, add an animation event and in the inspector, click the function drop down menu and call disable flip. Then on the frame where the attack is supposed to do damage, so the second frame in our case, add another event and call check attack one hitbox. Then on our second last frame, we will add another event and call enable flip. Then at the very end of our animation, we will add an event and use it to call finish attack one. Now just repeat this for the second attack animation. We can now click on our player and create a new empty game object and call it attack one position. Then just drag this object into our player combat script and set the attack one radius to 0.8. You should see the circle of the hitbox appear now. While we are here, we can set the rest of our variables. I'm going to set the damage to 10 and the input timer to 0.2. And then just make sure that combat enabled is ticked. We can now adjust the position of the hitbox in front of our character to where we want. I like to go to the animation frame where the function gets called to see if it looks right. Now, when we test our game, we'll see that it does not work. And that is because we forgot to make it so that our attack animations cannot transition to themselves. So head back into the animator and click on the transition, then under settings, untick can transition to self. Do this for both transitions. Also, don't forget to add all your transitions back to idle like I did. And that's that. We now have a character with an attack that alternates between animations to make it a bit more dynamic. The character can attack while jumping and while sliding, but not while climbing the ledge. Before I leave, I'm going to make one final change to my script, and that is to set the Y velocity of the dash to zero. In the next part, we're going to take a look at creating an object that can take the punishment our character is ready to deal. So I'll see you guys there. I hope you all have a lovely day.